Hello, it's Keith here, and this is lesson four of the platform specific series of my 68000 programming tutorials. We've looked at a few 68000 systems over the last few weeks, but this week we're going to look at the Sinclair QL. Now, the Sinclair QL is quite unique within the 68000 systems I'm covering because it's actually only capable of a maximum of eight colors or even four colors, and it's not a palletized system, so we can't configure those colors. It uses a fixed palette in both modes. Now, why is this? Well, basically, the um, Sinclair QL, for those who don't know, is kind of a halfway between an 8 and a 16-bit system. It uses a 68008 processor, and this has an 8-bit data bus, and it limits the speed quite heavily of the machine. It's about half the speed of a normal 68000. And also, it was designed to be very low cost, kind of as a successor to the ZX Spectrum. So it's not surprising that its graphics are more limited compared to other more typical 68000 systems that came later. Now, the system has two modes. One's an 8-color mode, which has black, red, green, blue, cyan, magenta, yellow, and white. And the other has four colors, and that has green, red, and white. Rather a strange combination there, but basically one mode was designed for word processing, and the other was, I guess, maybe designed for games, though the system never really had any. And it kind of ends up slower than the spectrum in some cases, so it's not really well suited to games. But anyway, those are the ones we're going to look at. Also, the eight color mode is capable of flashing colors on the screen, but again, th there's not much configurability here, so it's kind of a teletext style thing. It's not very useful, really. Anyway, we're going to have a look at this and see how to do it. So how do we actually control the system? Well, the system is very crude compared to some other systems. We don't need to use any firmware to control the screen. All we need to do is write data to memory address 18063. This is, controls the screen mode, and we can just change the um, color depth by setting bit 3 to a 1 or a 0, and that will change the screen mode for us. And so that's the start. And then all we need to do after that is write data to the screen area, which is from hexadecimal 20,000 to hexadecimal 28,000. And this will actually just plot the bytes to the screen. The screen is capable of two screen buffers. However, if you're using the operating system, the firmware system settings are saved in the second screen buffer. So that's not going to work. You would have to turn off the firmware. You will be able to do that if you follow my tutorials, because I never use the firmware systems. I always try and go as close to the hardware as I can. Anyway, let's have a look. Now, if you're looking to create sprites for the Sinclair QL, you can use my Acre Sprite Editor, which is free and open source. And what it can do is you can define the eight colors in this fixed palette here. Just draw your sprite in here, and then you can export to the Sinclair QL, and we can do a raw 8-bitmap or a raw 4-color bitmap, and we'll be seeing both today, and you can see the result of that here. Now, when we use these screen modes, we do have to understand how the bytes are stored in memory. The bytes are stored in two-byte pairs in words, and you'll find that the, depending on the color mode, they work differently. Now, in four-color mode, it's basically in normal bit planes, so the high byte is the green bit plane, and the low byte is the red bit plane, and if you combine the two together, you end up with white. So if bit 7 is set here, then that will be red. If it's only set here, it will be green. If both are set, then it would be white, and if neither were set, then that pixel will be black. So it's pretty straightforward. Now, in 8-color mode, it's slightly different. We work in four pixel blocks, and they are kind of interleaved together. For pixel 3, we have red here, we have blue here, and we have green here, and then we have the flashing bit here. Now, we will be discussing the flashing bit. It's... Um, it's interesting in a way, but it's not very useful. It's also not widely supported by emulators, and I'm not going to be able to show it you because for some reason QEmulator won't work on Windows 7 with the flashing bit. It only works on a, an emulation through Windows XP, and it's not very interesting anyway. So we will be discussing it now, but I'm not going to show it you. Now, the way the flashing bits work is maybe slightly odd. When we set the flashing bit for a pixel, it doesn't cause that pixel to flash. What it does is it tells the hardware to make the rest of the line flash. And what will happen is if you imagine that these pixels have got these colors here, green, blue, red, green, blue, red, and so on, and then we set the first pixel, the green pixel, to flash, what will happen is for every alternate frame of the flashing, the pixels will have their true colors here, but then they will all have the color of the flashing pixel here. Now, the next time there's a pixel with a flashing bit set, that will set the flashing to turn off again. So this pixel here, after the second flashing pixel, will have its normal color in both frames. So you can see here that it's kind of like an off and on state, the flashing bit, and it doesn't denote that that pixel itself will flash. It actually defines the color that the following pixels will flash. Now, the flashing is reset every line. So if we set the flashing pixel here, then all of the following pixels of the line will flash, but at the start of the next line of the screen, flashing will be turned off again. And it's important to notice this is a hardware function, so it's not dependent on interrupts or the firmware working correctly or anything like that. Okay, so there we go. So that's the theory of how the flashing works. 
and how the pixels are laid out in the screen memory and also how the screen memory itself works. So let's have a look at the example code we're going to be using today. So if you've been following this series in the past, we're going to be using the same bitmap test code. It just dumps the bytes to the screen and it, the bytes are defined down here by this bitmap label. And the file that we're using is a raw file created by AccuSprite Editor. So please download that if you want to know how to convert the files. Now we've got an option for the Sinclair QL. We can run in eight color mode or four color mode just by unrimming this symbol definition here. And, the, and it's really simple on the Sinclair QL. All we need to do is we need to continuously move bytes from the source data to the screen. The only thing, difference is we need to change the loop counter because the amount of data is covering twice the pixels in four color mode than it is in eight color mode. So let's see the code in action. So here's the eight color mode. You can see we've got our Chibico sprite. Now we're not using all eight colors here, but you can take my word for it that this is the eight color mode. And then if we just remove this rem comment here and run again. Now it's important to notice that it doesn't matter what screen mode I select at the start because the code is actually changing the screen mode for us. So you can see here, this is now four color mode and you'll notice the text is now half the width. As I say, I think this was really designed as a word processing mode, but it was very simple for me to support it today. So I thought, well, why not cover that as well? So that's what we're doing. So let's have a look at the code that's doing the actual work. You can see there's not very much of it, which is quite nice. The um, screen is, is structured very simply. Every line of the screen is 128 bytes wide. And as I said before, a, a word will define eight pixels and we've got one color channel and then another color channel, or in the case of the eight color mode, we've got the bits interleaved, but it's basically the same. So we are using two bytes for each cluster of pixels. And that's quite important to know when we're defining our screen pause here. So we've got this get screen pause command, which will allow us to effectively locate a byte position within the memory for when we're going to draw data to it. So we're specifying the X position in bytes and we're specifying the Y position in lines. Well, it, I say bytes, but in this case, it's clusters of eight pixels. So um, it's slightly different there because of the hardware screen configuration. It seemed most appropriate to do it that way. So all we're doing here is we're firstly just stripping it off so we make sure we only get one byte of the screen definition. The screen on the Sinclair QL is a maximum of 256 by 256. So we don't need more than a single byte to define a definition, but that's just what we're doing there. And then we've got this screen width 256 definition. This was for my Grime 68000 program. That kind of works around a 256 by 192 size screen. The reason for that is that's the most common screen size across all platforms everywhere. You know, things like the MSX and the ZX Spectrum were that size. A lot of systems are that size. So systems that have a larger screen size, I tend to try and centralize and just make a bit more like that so that I can write a game that works in a consistent way on all the systems. Now, what we need to do next is we need to shift the X coordinate by one bit to the left. That's because we're working in words, a word of course being two bytes. So we're effectively doubling X. So we select a word and this means that we can move consistently along the screen in eight pixel jumps or four, four pixel jumps if we're working in eight color mode next we need to multiply y by 128 that's 128 bytes per line irrespective of what screen mode we're in the screen data starts at memory address 20,000. so we're loading that into a6 and then we're adding the calculation of our x position and our y position to that memory address there that's very straightforward and when we want to move down a line, we're just using this get light next line command, which is just adding 128 to A6, which is our calculated screen definition. And we do that whenever we've completed drawing a line within our bitmap drawing routine here. You can see this is a bit over complex here because we've got all these different versions for the different hardware platforms. There's a very simple version displayed here, which is effectively the same code, just with all of the irrelevant code deleted out of it. So that's something that you might want to have a look at if you're finding this a bit daunting because of all the Atari ST and X68000 code in here. Now, the only thing that's missing from that is the actual defining of the screen mode. But to be honest, that's very straightforward as well. All we need to do is we need to set bit zero of memory address 18063, and that will select the four color mode. Or we can set bit one to set the eight color mode. Now you can do that with the firmware as well, but as I've said before, I don't like using the firmware and we're actually disabling interrupts here to turn it off. This gives us the advantage that we can use all of the system memory without worrying. And of course it does mean we can also use that second screen buffer if we want later to allow for page flipping. Now, one thing I will say is according to the documentation, bit one is supposed to actually turn the screen off, make it black. I didn't see that didn't seem to work for me. So maybe I'm doing something wrong or maybe the emulators aren't supporting it, but it's a, it doesn't actually seem to have any function when I tried it. So 
don't don't be surprised if you try it and it doesn't work either. But anyway, that's all there is to getting bitmap data onto the screen. Now as one extra bonus, I want to just discuss a crude vBlank routine. I didn't find I really needed it for Grime 68000 because the um, Sinclair QL was unfortunately slower than the other systems I was working on. It was more a case of making it, the QL version faster than actually trying to slow it down. When it comes to detecting vBlank, what you need to do is you need to use port 18021. Now this is the interrupt port and each of these bits in here actually denotes a different interrupting device and the one we want is frame vsync and what you need to do is you need to actually reset the interrupts to mark them as red and then wait for the next interrupt to occur. So just for simplicity all I'm doing is I'm setting all of the interrupts as handled and then waiting for any interrupt to occur. Now the most frequent interrupt is going to be vBlank. Uh, it's unlikely your microdriver is going to be shouting up about anything. So as I say I, I'm kind of oversimplifying it here and the, the reason for that was I was actually having some trouble getting this working in the early days. I think I was probably just misunderstanding it to be honest because um, I don't think it's very well documented how to detect vBlank or vSync on the Sinclair QL but th this does seem to work and that this is what I believe from the documentation I've read online is the best way of doing it. So anyway, that's just a little bonus there if you wanted to know about that. I always like to try wherever I've struggled to find answers on something to then put it in my own content because if I couldn't find it before, well, it's obviously not being publicized well enough. So I thought I'd just mention that there. Now, of course, there is some extra code within the tutorials that are doing graphics and that's for the printing of the characters. Now, the fonts within my tutorials are a one bit per pixel font. It's a black and white font and it came originally from the Chibi Akamas game. And we always convert that on all of the systems to the screen mode that we're using. So if you want to look at that, it's in the functions. I'm not going to cover it really here, but basically all we're doing is we're bit shifting, if required, the colors of the one bit per pixel font into the highest color on the system, which is color seven or color four, depending on whether you're in the four color or the eight color screen mode. So we just shift that around and we load it into memory. But as I say, this is basically based on the bitmap code today. So if you're interested in that, please take a look at that yourself. Hopefully you'll be able to understand it. Now we've covered the get screen pods command and the byte format of the screens. Anyway, that's all there is to the Sinclair QL. The beauty of the Sinclair QL is if, if you're uh, coming from a Z80 based background and you're used to having a lot of control and a lot of simplicity, you may not want to use these more advanced systems that have got more complex display modes. And so the Sinclair QL is kind of like a nice bridging gap between the 8-bits and the 16-bits if you want to have the full control and you just want your simple graphics and you don't want to start worrying about layers and uh, tile maps and things. So it, it's maybe one that's worth considering. I'm certainly finding it quite enjoyable. Anyway, that's all for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks for watching and goodbye.